Uh, thank you, Jen. Uh, this is Nathan Stelter, Vice President of Business Development and Marketing here at the Stelter Company. Uh, excited to have everybody joining us today uh, for another uh, great uh, presentation in, in the Stelter webinar series. Uh, as an industry leader in plan giving marketing, Stelter is committed to providing uh, innovative solutions and education for everybody's marketing needs and happy to provide this complimentary webinar today presented by Christopher Hoyt. Uh, before I pass it off to Christopher, uh, I wanted to say just a few notes about our webinar series. Uh, if this is your first one, uh, time with us, uh, welcome. Uh, if you're a regular listener, uh, welcome back. Uh, we're happy and honored to add Christopher to our our long list of esteemed uh, individuals that have presented uh, free of charge for all uh, all you in the uh, nonprofit industry. Uh, names like Dr. Russell James, Jeff Comfort, Scott Lumpkin, uh, Craig Ruck, uh, and recently Ann Melvin uh, of Harvard. Uh, if you have missed any of those previous webinars, they're always archived on the Stelter.com website at Stelter.com backslash webinars. Uh, our next two uh, will be uh, coming up here in November. Uh, myself and actually our Director of Marketing Research, Cheryl Sturm, are presenting a new webinar uh, based on some brand new research that just came out on Matures to Boomers, What Playing Green Professionals Need to Know. That's Wednesday, November 8th. And then our final one of the year is uh, going to come to us from Greg Sharkey, a Senior philanthropic, uh, Philanthropic Advisor at the Nature Conservancy, on questions to start playing gift presentations. Uh, it's, a, it's a great talk on really the practical ways of, of engaging donors and navigating some of those talks. But back to today's presentation, again, our presenter today, Christopher Hoyt, is Professor of Law uh, at the University of Missouri, Kansas City School of Law. Uh, he teaches courses in the areas of federal taxation, actually just coming to us from a class uh, this morning, business organizations, retirement plans, and tax-exempt organizations. He's currently the chair of the American Bar Association's Committee on Lifetime and Testamentary uh, Charitable Gift Planning, Section of Probate and Trust, and serves on the editorial board of Trust and Estates Magazine. He's a frequent speaker at legal and educational programs and has been quoted in numerous publications, including the Wall Street Journal, Forbes, Money Magazine, and the Washington Post. He received an undergraduate degree in economics from Northwestern University and dual law and accounting degrees from the University of Wisconsin. I'd like to hand it off to you, Christopher. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Nathan, and, and welcome, everybody. Um, during our next 50 minutes together, I thought I'd share with you some plan giving strategies that involve retirement assets. Uh, also, as you probably know, a few hours ago, the White House released their blueprint for tax changes, and we'll address how some of those might affect uh, these uh, charitable giving procedures. Uh, we'll see how the procedures go. It's, it's a nine-page document, and trying to simplify the tax code, which has gotten so thick and so complex, I, the U.S. tax code has just gotten so large and thick and complex that it's in five years, if nothing happens, will be one of only two man-made objects you'll be able to see with the naked eye from outer space. And that's the direction we're heading. We'll see if the tax changes actually work. And who knows, if you follow the news the last eight months, we've been draining the swamp, so maybe this will sail through Congress, not. So here, the four topics I'd like to address, and I welcome your thoughts in the questions and comments. Uh, charitable IRA rollover, um, the basics of it, and, and how the new proposals might have impacted. Uh, IRAs and second marriages, and there's a estate planning challenge, and really the charitable mater trust is a very attractive solution for a problem of marriages that have large amounts of retirement accounts. The third is called IRD, which stands for Income and Respected Decedent in Taxable Estates, and basically when somebody inherits a retirement plan distribution, that's taxable income, it's income respected decedent. And taxable estates, I'm talking about the federal estate tax. And again, the proposal that came out a few hours ago was to kill the estate tax, but the talk in Washington is that's not politically likely. We'll probably still have it. We'll see what happens. But anyhow, with a retirement plan account, if you're rich enough, you have over five and a half million dollars, that's taxed twice. And I can show you an appealing way to say, that, you know, why don't you just leave that to charity? And finally, I think for many of you, a new strategy, income-based charitable bequests. And I take the position that the charitable bequest that's still being drafted today is just so 20th century, that there's a 21st century to char draft charitable bequests. And I'm going to go forward on the assumption that every charitable gift has a cost. But if we can structure it in a way to save taxes, that will reduce the cost of the charitable gift. 
And this new idea of an income-based charitable request is j just that. So um, let's go forward with charitable IRA rollover. As you all know, the law was made permanent in 2015. And if we have an individual who, for example, has to take out $20,000 from the IRA, they're, they're required to take distributions, they have to take out $20,000, and they say, well, give $15,000 to the charity and give me $5,000. If they do this, the $15,000 gift to the charity will not report as taxable income. They'll only pay tax on the five that they got. Now, the price they get is they give up the charitable income tax deduction. They, on Schedule A with itemized deductions, they won't deduct the $15,000. Instead, the tax benefit is just never reporting the $15,000 in the first place. To be eligible, as everyone knows, you have to be over the age of 70 and a half. The most you can do is $100,000. But the real appeal of this law is that the charitable gift satisfies your required minimum distributions from your IRA. And that individual who had to take out $20,000 now says, I satisfy the requirement, $20,000 left my account, but I only pay tax on five. So obviously, you could take out a $20,000 deduction a distribution. You could put it in your checking account. You could write a check to a charity for fifteen. dollars So why use this law? Well, the people who win are donors who take the standard deduction because, as you all know, you add up all your itemized deductions for the year and you ask, is that more or less than the standard deduction? And if it's more, you itemize. And the big three itemized deductions are your state and local income tax, your mortgage interest deduction, and your charitable gifts. And if you're single, the standard deduction is $6,300. If you're married, it's $12,000. 600 roughly. Well, let's take a look at that new tax proposal that just came out this morning. And when I did these slides, I was just based on leaks from the White House. <laughs> and the actual proposal is slightly different. They proposed to double the standard deduction. That is for six single people, instead of being $6,000, it's $12,000 and uh, I, not $12,700. And then the White House proposal this morning is that the, for a married joint couple, the standard deduction will be $24,000. How can they be so generous, by the way, you ask? And they eliminate that personal exemption deduction. You know how you deduct $4,000 for yourself and your dependent? None of that. Instead, the $4,000 deduction per dependent would be replaced by a larger standard deduction. So the proposal this morning is the standard deduction will be 12000 single, 24000 married joint. And they also propose to eliminate all itemized deductions except for the charitable deduction and the mortgage interest deduction. And the big debate will be to eliminate the deduction for state and local income tax. And the states of New York, California, New Jersey, Connecticut, Maryland, Minnesota, uh, that's where they're going to put up a fight. They want to keep that deduction. So offhand, you think, well, okay, the charitable deduction is safe. Uh, the White House says keep the charitable deduction. But look at the implication of this. If this law is enacted and the only itemized deductions that you can take are the mortgage interest deduction and the charitable deduction, and then think of your senior donors, donors over the age of 65, 70, 80, they've paid off the home mortgage so that the only itemized deduction they'd have is the charitable income tax deduction. And that means for a married couple filing a joint return, and if the number is $24,000, they would not get any tax benefit from the first $24,000 of charitable gifts. They would still take the standard deduction. So th what I've heard is that right now, one out of five people get income tax savings from charitable gifts because only one out of three itemize, and then there's only a certain number who don't give to charity. But if this proposal is enacted, only one out of 20 people would get benefits from the charitable gifts because they would not give away more than their standard deduction. So what's the implication of this proposal? And one implication I'll suggest to you, welcome your comments, is that if it looks like this law is going to get enacted, in 2017, you might notify your donors and suggest they accelerate their charitable deductions into 2017. And you might mention they might accelerate their state income tax payments, make you know the real estate payments and everything else in 2017 if they're going to lose the deduction in 2018. But give them credit 
for paying in 27, 18, or 2018 deductions and like. And then in 2018, this charitable IRA rollover law is going to be even more important because more and more people will take the standard deduction. By giving money from your IRAs, you actually get a tax benefit for your charitable gift. Now, that's the problem with a framework that was released this morning. It's a nine-page document, very basic framework, blueprint kind of thing. We don't know the details. For example, will Congress, while they do this, also repeal charitable IRA rollover? You know, And will we hire lobbyists to keep it? So... Um, you know, we thought in January that we'd actually have the tax overhaul completed by August. Today's September 27th. We just get the blueprint released. At this rate, I predict we're going to see the actual text of the proposals and charitable IRA rollover and the like. We'll probably see the actual text sometime before the next solar eclipse. But I'm, I'm not, uh, I, I'm not confident that they can get this done before the end of the year. At any rate, if the charitable IRA ro rollover law survives. The big winners will be people who take the standard deduction that they can give from their IRA, reduce their income, and get a tax benefit from the charitable gifts. And also people in states like Ohio, where the states have no state income tax deduction for charitable gifts, Ohio, Indiana, uh, Massachusetts, and the like. Third, as your income goes up, you start losing certain tax breaks. Social Security benefits become taxable at $34,000 of income, uh, married joint. Medicare B premiums go up as your income goes up. The health care surtax if your income's over $200,000 and the like. So running through the legal requirements, most of you know it, to make the charitable IRA or rollover gift, you have to be over the age of 7 and a half. This only works with gift from IRAs. You can't do it with 43Bs or 401Ks. You have to, if you have a professor, roll somebody over to the IRA to do it. Third, most IRA administrators mail the check to the charity, but all that's required is the check is issued in the name of the charity. The statute says that the, is, I, the, the check is issued directly from the IRA to the charity. Uh, you can send it to the donor who could forward it to the charity or present it at the ceremony, um, but that's all that's required. What You get the question all the time, I just got a $20,000 check. This very day, give you, that won't work. The IRA has to issue the check in the name of the charity. Every charity is eligible. Every public charity is eligible except for the ones that are most fun. First, your grant-making private non-operating foundation doesn't qualify, but if you have a private operating foundation like a museum, it qualifies. And donor-advised funds and supporting orgs, 509 the Friends of the Hospital, don't qualify. Fifth, every dollar has to qualify for charitable income tax deduction. There can't be any financial benefit to the donor, like a dinner or a charitable gift annuity. Uh, and then skipping the last one, be sure that the donor has the letter from the charity saying there are no goods or services received for the gift. The IRS does not require the IRA administrators to code the charitable gifts. They just say 20,000 has left the IRA, and they tell the donor 20,000 has left your IRA. It's up to you to put the initials on your tax return, QCD. And so they get these questions, why didn't you pay tax in all 20? They just produced the letter from you. It was a charitable gift of 15, and the problem goes away. Some technical observations. Yes, the charitable gift can satisfy a legally binding pledge. Private foundations can't do that. Uh, but yes, you can make a legally binding pledge and have it pay from the IRA, and donor advised funds have that issue. On a joint return, each spouse can give up to $100,000 per IRA. $200,000 together, but you can't go like 150 from her IRA and 50 from the spouse's IRA and the like. And finally, uh, I get this question. My mom died. She was giving money from her IRA to charity. Uh, I'm 58 years old. I just inherited. Can I use my inherited IRA from my mom to make gifts to the charity? And the IRS says if the beneficiary of an inherited IRA is over the age of 70 and a half, then yes, you can use the inherited IRA to make charitable gifts and satisfy the required distribution requirements. But if you're just 58, you can't do it. So let's now move to the other planning strategy of charitable plan giving and solving a problem in blended, fam blended marriages where each spouse has children from a prior marriage. IRAs and second marriages, the CRT solution. And by way of background, when a person dies, the tax law requires you to start liquidating the retirement plan account. 
and the tax planning you have for the people who inherit it is to defer the distributions as long as possible. And you say, why? So suppose you have a $100,000 IRA that you have just inherited. And just to make the math simple, let's assume you can earn 10% on your money every year. So your $100,000 IRA could earn $10,000 a year. So you're tempted to say, well, I'll just take it out. Give me a check for $100,000. Well, bingo, your inheritance is taxable income. It's called income in respect of decedent. And you'll have $100,000 of taxable income. So now you've got to pay income tax on it. Let's say you pay 40% to the feds and the states. So you pay $40,000 of tax, and now you have $60,000 left over. And now you invest your money at 10%. And your $60,000 will produce $6,000 a year. And so you say, wow, I wish I'd never taken that money out. I wish I'd kept it at $100,000. And that's tax deferral. The longer I can defer paying the income tax on that $40,000 and paying it to the IRS, then that $40,000 is in your retirement plan account producing income to you. You have an extra $4,000 a year. So that's what estate planners try to push is what's called the stretch IRA to make payments over the beneficiary's life expectancy. And that's permitted under current law. I'll give, give you an example that you can keep the balance of the $100,000 and just earn $10,000 a year instead of six. Now, when people hear the term life expectancy, I can take it out over my life expectancy. They say I can take it out for the rest of my life. And that's not what it means. A life expectancy is a fixed number of years, and it just says that half of the people your age will die before that point, and half will die after that point. It doesn't predict when you can expect to die. So here on the slide are the life expectancy numbers that the tax law requires us to use. So a simple example, grandma is in the office of the IRA administrator at a, at a bank. And she says, uh, I have this IRA. My, right now it's called Grandma's IRA. And I'm doing some estate planning. And what would happen if I named my granddaughter, who's 30 years old, as the beneficiary of my IRA? When I die, my granddaughter gets it. And the bank says, well, when you die, two things are going to happen. Number one, uh, we're going to change the name of the IRA. We're going to make it what's called an inherited IRA. And it's going to say Grandma's IRA beneficiary granddaughter. The second thing we're going to do is change the social security number on the account because we're going to write checks to the granddaughter. And right now our computer has your social security number on it, grandma. But after you die, we've got to issue it to the social security number of the granddaughter. So we'll put the granddaughter's social security number on it. And then we'll cut checks to the granddaughter and the computer will say to the IRS, that's taxed your granddaughter's social security number. Now that's what you're all dealing with, the inherited IRAs for charities, is the, the bank's computer can't just write a check to you from grandma's IRA when she names it payable to a charity. Their computer system says you gotta retitle it to say grandma's IRA beneficiary charity and get the charity's tax ID number on it. But with that crazy Patriot Act stuff, they're asking you for the social security number of the CFO and things like that, and I'm sorry for that. But that's all that's going on is the bank computer um, the bank computer can't handle a check straight from grandma's IRA to you because then the, it'll tell the IRS it was taxed to grandma who died, and here's her social security number. So um, I apologize for that, but that's just kind of why they're doing that retitling and inherited IRA stuff. But getting back to the granddaughter, what the tax law says is the granddaughter can take it out to age 83. Her life expectancy is 53 more years. We can pay it out until she's 83 years old. And then it stops at age 84. Oh, she says, what about my son? My son is 60 years old. What about him if I named him as the beneficiary? Same thing. Grandma's IRA beneficiary son. But your son has a life expectancy to age 85. But we can keep that IRA alive. We can keep it $100,000 for 25 years. Oh, what about my twin sister? She's also 80 years old. Okay, well, 80 years old has a life expectancy of 10 years. Grandma's IRA, beneficiary twin sister, and we liquidate it in 10 years. So what you do is you take the remaining life expectancy. For example, the twin sister, we pay at one-tenth, and then every year it's a countdown, one-ninth, one-eighth, one-seventh, one-sixth, and so on, and that's empty in 10 years. But the power of the stretch IRA is for young beneficiaries, one-fifty-third is about 2%. 
for the son who's 60 years old, 125th is about 4%. And this power of the stretch IRA is we can have these payments last for 25, 50 years when you name a young beneficiary. By comparison, for the twin sister, the mandatory payout is one tenth, 10%. And the IRA will be liquidated pretty fast. Now, with this proposed tax change, I think there's a really good chance, I put it at like 60%, that Congress is going to kill the stretch IRA. And they're going to propose that all IRAs have to be liquidated in just five years after death. Now, they're going to grandfather it. They're basically going to say that people who died up to the year 2017, the children can have stretch IRAs. But for people who die beginning of the year 2018, the IRAs and 401k plans and everything else has to be liquidated in five years. Now, there's exceptions to the five-year payout. Well, we've seen the statute that they've proposed. It was proposed most recently in 2016, and the Senate Finance Committee forwarded this to the full Senate. So I, I feel pretty sure that the stretch IRA has a limited time life left. The exceptions would be a spouse could take it out over his or her life expectancy. A minor child could take it out to age 21, and then at age 21, the five-year clock starts ticking, and it has to be empty at age 26. A disabled person could take it out over their life expectancy to age 83. And then if you name someone who's not more than 10 years younger than you, they could take it out over their remaining life expectancy. So let's see, if grandma died, for example, in 2017, and she named the 30-year-old grandchild, the 60-year-old son, and the 80-year-old twin sister to each get a third, then each of them would have these payout streams. It, it can be done. But if she dies in 2018, it's the twin sister who's got the best deal. Because for the child and the grandchild, that $100,000 IRA will shrink to $60,000 in five years the government will collect their $40,000. So keep your eye on this law about inherited IRAs because the significance for charities is that if somebody has two, three, four million dollars in IRAs and donors are a lot more likely to consider a charitable bequest, that's a lot of income for the kids, a lot of tax. And then we're gonna get to this other option of retirement accounts to tax exempt charitable meter trusts. You can say, you know, the tax law says your child has to take the money out in five years and pay tax on it all in five years. How'd you like it for the life of the child? I'd love it. Well, leave it to a charitable remainder trust for the life of the child. And then we'll talk about a charitable remainder trust for a spouse and kids. So IRAs and second marriages. And uh, this is a little bit of background on the required distributions. And again, for a lot of us in the middle class, the retirement plan account is the largest asset we have. Uh, I've been saving for 30 years for in my IRAs and 401k plans, and my retirement savings is three times as much money as I have equity in my home. Uh, I don't want to brag, but it's up to about um, $36,000 now, and I attribute that to having started early and my own particular skills as an investor, and <laughs> it's $36,000. But for a lot of people, that's the biggest asset they have, and the challenge in second marriages is this. Although for the child, the twin sister, the grandchild, we take grandma's IRA and retitle it. If grandma has a surviving spouse, he or she has an option, and that is he or she can roll over the deceased spouse's retirement accounts into their own IRA versus the child, the twin sister, the grandchild. Their only option is an inherited IRA, but a surviving spouse can do a rollover. So what's a rollover? Well, basically, if grandma is married to, for example, grandpa, grandpa would set up a new account in his own name, and then grandpa would fill out the form, you know, name, address, social security number, and then who's going to be the beneficiary upon death? So let me give you a dramatic example, and for those of you in community property states, you can relate to this as well. Uh, we're going to have a man married to a woman, and the man's going to die first. And the man has children from a prior marriage, and the woman has children from a prior marriage. And just to make it real dramatic, the man has only one asset, $4 million in an IRA. That's it. No house, no car, no real estate just for that. His second wife has no assets. And so normally, the best estate planning strategy is to do a rollover. The surviving spouse will take the $4 million and roll it over 
into her new IRA. She'll set up an account with her name on it, her social security number on it. She'll select the beneficiaries. And now the man says, well, what assurance do I have that a child from my first marriage will be named as the beneficiary, that when you fill out that form, you're going to name my kids instead of naming your kids. And that's the estate planning challenge in second marriages. When the surviving spouse does a rollover, you're giving complete control of those assets to the surviving spouse. Those of you who know estate planning know that normally for second marriages, we use something called a Q-tip trust, Qualified Terminal Interest Property Trust, and that deals give my income to my second wife for life, remainder of my kids from the first marriage. The problem with having an IRA payable to a Q-tip trust is it liquidates real fast, especially with that five-year rule. If that's enacted, you'd have to liquidate in five years. So what do people do in second marriages? Well, one of them is, one idea is to buy some life insurance for the kids from the first marriage. The other is to split the IRAs. And sorry, $4 million. How about $3 million to you, $1 million to my kids from the first marriage? I want to warn you that you can do that with IRAs. Uh, but if you have a 401k plan or a pension or profit sharing plan or another plan covered by ERISA, it, if you're married when you die, it doesn't matter who you named as the beneficiary of the 401k plan. Instead, as a matter of law, it's going to go to, to whoever you're married to on the date of death. The only way to get around that is if the spouse signs a waiver and says, I consent to $1 million going, going to kids from the first marriage. But with IRAs, it's okay to name $3 million to one, $1 million to the other. But now, let's say this guy's in a community property state, and you've got $4 million in IRAs, and half of it be or legally belongs to the spouse. One idea is to have the IRAs payable to a two-generation charitable remainder trust. Now, what's that? Well, you all know CRTs. CRTs pay a stream of payments 5% per year with a unit trust for the life of the beneficiary or for a term of years, like up to 20 years. And then when the trust terminates, either at the end of the term of years or when a person dies, the remainder interest goes to charity. But the magic of the CRT is it's exempt from the income tax. That is, when a million dollars leaves an IRA with one check to the Chair of Mater Trust, there's going to be a 1099R saying, oh, Chair of Mater Trust, you just got $100 million of taxable income. The CRT says, we don't care. We're a tax exempt Chair of Mater Trust. We're going to keep the whole million dollars. It's not going to shrink to $600,000. So the idea with a two-generation Chair of Mater Trust is, Let's say the man says, all right, I got a $4 million IRA, and I'm going to give half of it to you. And if it's a community property state, that would be the $2 million a spouse already owns. And I know you're not going to name my kids from my first marriage as a beneficiary when you do the rollover. But the other $2 million won't go to you as a rollover. Instead, I'm going to have the $2 million go to a charitable remainder trust. And basically, the charity is going to get $2 million. But before the charity gets the $2 million, it's going to pay an income stream to you for the rest of your life, 5%, which is $100,000 a year. And then when you, my second wife, die, it's not going to go to charity. At that point, the income stream, I have two kids, is going to go $50,000 a piece to each of my two kids. And they're going to get that for the rest of their lives. And then when they finally die, the charity gets the $2 million. And that's a two-generation charitable meter trust. And the magic of this is I'm moving it from one tax-exempt trust, the IRA, to another tax-exempt trust, the charitable meter trust, and no income tax is paid. Now, the reason this has not been popular in the 1990s was people easily paid the federal estate tax. And when you have a two-generation CRT, spouse and kids, you lose the marital estate tax deduction. But for states under $5.5 million, the estate tax is not a problem. And a two-generation CRT is a solution to a problem that's very vexing to people in second marriages. And that's the solution I have here. Uh, can be a solution for second marriages when the estate is top-heavy retirement assets. Give half of the IRA to the spouse. Don't say all of it in the CRT. Don't say all of it rollover. But give them kind of a blend of the two. And have half of the IRA go rollover, half the CRT. And she says, what if I need more than $100,000 a year? Well, he says... That's what your $2 million rollover is for. You can dip in a principal for that, but you can't dip in the principal of the CRT. 
Now, some technical requirements. You understand this. You're plan giving advisors. There has to be a 10% charitable deduction. So if it's a second marriage and the kids are teenagers, this isn't going to work because people have to be over the age of 30 to get the 10% deduction. What about a 4% unit trust payout? Sorry, it's a crut. I have to have a 5% payout. And again, there's no marital estate tax deduction. And then the donor should have charitable intent. Let's not use this as a gimmick for income tax purposes. If the donor says, listen, if your second wife and your kids from the first marriage all die in a car crash the year after you die, and the charity gets the $2 million in one year, the donor says, I'm cool with that then that's the donor you want. You don't want this as a gimmick for people who are not terribly inclined. Now, I, I addressed this in an article. If you want the private letter rulings, the legal authority, you can easily find the article with a search with three words. SSRN stands for Social Science Research Network. Hoyt is my name. It's nice and short. H-O-Y-T, Hotel Oscar Yankee Tango, and the word rollover. And there's a short five-page article, the CRT to charity ideas on page four with the private letter rulings and the regulations that back it up. That's if you want the legal authority. SSRN Hoyt rollover. Let's go to our next topic, which is the double taxation of retirement assets and leave it to charity. As you all know, when President Bush took over in the White House, he said, I want to repeal the death tax. And when he took office, if a person died with just $675,000, which is like a garage door in California, they had to start paying federal state tax and everything over that. So we gradually increased the threshold. In the year 2010, we had the weird outcome that the estate tax was repealed for one year. And now we have a $5 million threshold. So in the year 2017, if a person dies with less than $5.49 million, they don't pay any federal state tax. Quite a change from $675,000 in 2001. So let's talk about retirement accounts and the estate tax. And the question is, what is the tax rate? Before we get to how the retirement accounts are taxed, let's just talk about a rich person in your town. The richest person in your town just got $100 worth of income in February. And then they died in August. So the question is, of the $100 that was received in February, how much will the kids inherit in September? So first of all, when a person has $100 worth of income, you've got to pay income tax on that. And there's a, rich people pay a 40% tax rate, actually, with a surtax. It's higher than that. But let's just say it's 40%. So now there's $60 left in the checking account. And now they die in August, and they're rich enough to pay the estate tax, so we collect the estate tax on it. And there's a 40% federal estate tax. Bottom line, rich people are in a 64% tax bracket if they live in Florida or Texas. If you live in a state with state income tax, then instead of just 64%, you add the state income tax. If you have a state inheritance tax, it's even higher. So basically, when rich people have $100 worth of income, the lowest tax rate is like 64%. Now let's talk about an inheritance. And let's suppose you inherit two things. You inherit grandpa's land and grandpa bought it in the 1960s for $30,000 and it's worth a million dollars when you inherit it. And grandpa had a retirement plan account of 100,000 bucks. And basically you all know what's called a step up in basis. That when you get grandpa's land, your cost basis is not grandpa's $30,000. It's the value at the time of death, a million dollars. If you sell it for a million dollars and fifty thousand dollars, a million five, you only pay tax on the growth and value after death. It's a step up in basis. But for grandpa's retirement plan account, that's called income in respect to decedent. Grandpa was taking income tax deductions to fund the IRA. And the idea was he paid income tax when the money was taken out of the IRA in retirement. But grandpa died before he took the money out. So whoever inherits the income has to pay the income tax. That's IRD, amounts of income to which the decedent was entitled, but which were not includable in gross income before the decedent's death. And things like savings bond, interest, unpaid paychecks, but the big source today are retirement plan accounts. And there's company plans in a 401k, there's IRAs in section 408. You know the 43B tax sheltered annuities and 457 plans. Now the Roth account, that's tax-free. Don't give that to charity. Give that to family. 
But for tax planning as to what to leave to charity, it's number one, two, and three. The taxable 401k plans, the taxable IRAs, and the 403b plans. So, person dies um, August 20th, and they had a $10,000 IRA. And the next day, August 21st, the IRA is paid to the probate estate. And they're rich enough to pay the federal state tax. How is that tax? And the answer is a double tax. On the Form 706, the federal state tax return, we have to say one of the assets that was owned at the time of death was a $10,000 IRA. And then when we collect the $10,000 check, the estate has to pay income tax on it because it's income in respect to the decedent. So one $10,000 check from a retirement plan account to a taxable estate is taxed twice. First on the federal estate tax return and then again on the income tax return. So the example I gave you of how if you get your income before you die and you're rich, you pay a 64% tax rate. And this slide's coming real fast, but it's the same 64% tax rate on inherited retirement plan accounts. It's just in the opposite order. First, we hit it with a 40% estate tax. And then when the child gets the beneficiary, gets the distribution, or the estate gets the distribution, they pay income tax on it. But it's going to be the same 64% and then add your state's income tax and the like. So the argument is, if that $10,000 check was earmarked for charity, if IRD is payable to charity, I can write one check for $10,000 to charity, and I should be able to claim charitable deductions on both the estate tax return and the income tax return, as long as the will or the trust instrument has the right instructions. And I got the law on my side. There's a tax regulation that says, yes, IRD does qualify for a charitable income tax deduction. You do get a double deduction because IRD is both corpus on your state tax return and it's income. So you go to a donor who says, I have no charitable intent. Why should I give to charity? And let me show you the numbers. For taxable estates where a check was written to IRS, only 30% made a charitable bequest. 70% did not. And for taxable states that were over $50 million, 50, 60, 80, $100 million, only 55% of those large estates had a charitable bequest, 45% did not. But what intrigues me as a tax planner is that 55% of these taxable states had retirement accounts. So for that donor who says, I have no charitable intent, I say, oh, yes, you do. Because if your estate has a retirement plan account, if it has IRD, you are making a charitable gift. In Florida and Texas or Nevada, you're giving 64% of it to the federal government in taxes. If you live in a state like Minnesota, Maryland, Connecticut, New York, New Jersey, you're giving 80% of it to the federal government and the state government in taxes. And so you're making a charitable gift, but it's an involuntary charitable gift. And at a cost to your family of 20 cents a dollar or whatever, you can leave it to charity. Now, there's two ways to leave a retirement account to charity. The first is to name the charity as a beneficiary, which is that inherited IRA business. But the second is to pay the account to the estate or the trust that makes a charitable request. And what you're finding is that the charities like method number two, because they don't have to deal with an inherited retirement account like they do with method number one. But the estate planners like method number one. And the reason they like it is because there's tax traps with a retirement plan account payable to the estate. We have court cases and we have other rulings where IRD was in fact distributed to a charity by an estate or a trust. But the estate or trust was not allowed to claim a charitable income tax deduction to offset the income from the IRD. That is, there was a check for $100,000 from an IRA to, a, to an estate. The executor took that check, flipped it over, endorsed it, gave the $100,000 to the charity. They had $100,000 worth of income but they could not deduct the $100,000 gift on the income tax return because for a trust or an estate to get a charitable income tax deduction, the will or the trust instrument has to have instructions to pay income to charity. And most wills and most trust instruments don't have that instruction. So oversimplified, I've suggested that every will or every trust have language like this. If I make a charitable bequest, pay it first out of IRD if there is any. And that should get you the deduction. Now, we don't have time to go into all the details. And here, there's an article with all the details. The, uh, 
found, I don't know, for my English speaking friends on the phone, a uh, hundred footnotes, a hundred legal citations. And you can find it real easily with the search SSRN Hoyt IRD. And it tells you how to get income tax deductions for charitable bequests, how to structure it, what to do if your state gets the retirement plan distribution, yet there's no instruction to give income to charity. There's a way around it when the charity is a residuary beneficiary. But if you have that situation, just get that article. Every piece of legal authority is in that article. Last topic uh, is this new idea, and I would love to hear what you think. Income-based charitable bequests for states that will not be subject to state tax, a state's under five and a half million dollars. Whoa, have I heard this term before? Probably not, maybe you have. I just made it up. But what I'm trying to say to you is the typical charitable bequest that you see in documents is still drafted like in the 20th century. Example, today the typical charitable bequest is something like this. Pay $50,000 to charity and the remainder of my state to my children. Now, what that will do is it will get you a state tax savings. I can deduct $50,000 on the state tax return, but I can't deduct that on the income tax return of the estate. So let's do a case study. Somebody died with a million dollar estate and it says, pay $50,000 to the charity, pay the remainder of my state to my children. And there's only one child, a daughter. I can do that math, okay? 50000 is going to go to the charity. 950000 is going to go to the daughter. Okay. Now, something else you should know, that while we administered the estate, there was $60,000 of taxable income during the administration of the estate. $20,000 was an IRA that paid you know, $20,000 to the estate. That's income respect to the seed. And then there's $40,000 of taxable interest and dividends earned after the person died. So now we have to distribute a million sixty, the million that was there at the time of death, the sixty thousand dollars worth of income. Now, if you had instructions given my IRD to charity, I would get a twenty thousand dollar deduction. But there isn't that instruction, as most estates and trusts have don't have that. So what's going to happen is the charity's going to get fifty thousand dollars, the daughter's going to get a million ten, nine hundred fifty thousand dollars of assets owned at the time of death and $60,000 of investment income. And we say to the daughter, daughter, you're not just getting 950, you're getting a million 10 because we earned $60,000 of income after your dad died and uh, that's all going to you, so you'll pay income tax on that. Now, what is an income-based charitable bequest? And an income-based charitable bequest is a charitable bequest where the source of the payment is the estates, like the probate estates, taxable income. And today most people avoid probates, so they use a trust to do what a probate does. Or the source of the payment is the trust taxable income, rather than a distribution of corpus. My hope is you'll consider a wholesale change from the traditional way of drafting a charitable request. Let me give you an example. This man's will says nothing about a charitable bequest from corpus. But when I look at the instructions about what's supposed to happen to the income of the estate, it says all of this estate's income, paren, including capital gains and IRD, close paren. And the reason you do that is for trust accounting purposes, income is interest and dividends, but normally capital gains is principal allocated to the trust. You're saying, no, I want that capital gain to be paid out. An IRD is corpus under state law and is income under tax law, but it's not income for accounting purposes. So you add this phrase, I want all the estate's taxable income, including capital gains, including IRD, shall be distributed to the charity. Wow, all the income. Now, if the cumulative amount of income of this estate exceeds $50,000, then charity shall receive only a cumulative amount of $50,000 and all excess income shall be retained or distributed to my beneficiaries at the discretion of the executor or if you're using a trust, the trustee. Okay, the charity's gonna get $50,000 with either a traditional bequest or this income-based bequest. But with an income-based charitable bequest, the estate, the trust, and the children 
will not incur income tax liability on $50,000 worth of income. And in the simplest case, for anybody who makes a charitable bequest, you can generate a charitable income tax deduction that will offset all the income generated during the administration of a state or a trust whose purpose is like settling a probate estate. Let's go back to that fact pattern. Remember the fact pattern, the traditional charitable request, 50,000 of charity, everything else to my daughter, 60,000 of income is taxed to the child. Let's try the same facts with an income-based charitable bequest. Daughter, your dad died with a million dollars. You're gonna get all of it. But your dad had some interesting instructions about the income. He said the first $50,000 went to the charity and anything else would go to you. Well, there was $60,000 worth of income. So $50,000 is gonna to go to charity and now you're gonna get an extra $10,000. Let's cut the checks. Charity gets $50,000. The daughter gets a million ten, identical to the traditional bequest, but look at the income tax consequences. And that's what a lot of plan giving is all about, isn't it? Is trying to reduce taxes to maximize the gift at the lowest cost to the beneficiaries. So this is my recommendation for a non-taxable estate. Well, what about a taxable estate, a estate of six, seven, ten million dollars? I don't recommend it because with a taxable estate, you have to decide, do I want the charitable deduction to be on the estate tax return, let's say the estate tax is 40%, or do I want it to be on the income tax return? And maybe the beneficiaries are in a lower tax rate than 40%. But what percent of estates are over $5.5 million and pay estate tax? It's like 0.15%. So for the 99% of estates that have no estate tax, the tax planning is to take steps that reduce the only tax that a non-taxable state and its beneficiaries will occur, and that's the income tax. To shift our tax planning from our old-fashioned 20th century estate tax planning to the 21st century income tax planning. So bottom line, for a non-taxable state, a very large income-based charitable bequest offers the potential to eliminate the income tax liability for all income earned during the administration of a state. It's a new idea. I mean, I just ran this past people at conferences in April. They all thought it would work. And so it hasn't been tested yet. It'd be nice if we had some legal references we could use. So if you're looking for legal authority on the CRT for second marriages, just do your Google search, Bing, Yahoo. I'm not going to tell you what search engine to use. SSRN Hoyt Rollover, the fourth page of the article, gives you the legal authority of, in a second marriage, having the IRA payable to a charitable manor trust. If you're interested in this IRD issue about what happens if the estate's going to have taxable retirement fund distributions, how can they get a charitable income tax deduction? That's a real thorough article. It's 11 pages long, uh, 32 footnotes, and the footnotes have lots of private letter rulings and legal authority. And you can download that for free. It's a PDF file. It's just a simple file. SSRN Hoyt IRD. And this new art idea, which it's new to me, and maybe you, you knew about it, but it's, it's scary because it's so simple. I wrote about that in the American Bar Association publication called Probate and Property. It's in this month's issue, September, October 2017. It's called Tax Savings with Income. Us. I'm working on, that's 4,000 words, I'm working on an 8,000-word article with lots of legal authority, and I'll post that on SSRN. So, wasn't too, and it's over to people who know what they're talking about. There's Nathan and Jen. So thank you very much, everybody, for listening to this. I hope you got something out of it. Thanks so much, Christopher. We did get a couple questions that came in during the presentation, and uh, we have a couple minutes, so if anyone else has questions, go ahead and type those into your questions pane and send them in. Uh, first one is from Robert, and it's going back to the very beginning of your presentation. He's asking, is it better for the IRA checks to come from the accounts rather than from the donor? Um, I, I'm always a little leery about mailing the IRA check that's issued in the name of the charity. It has to be issued in the name of the charity, sending it to the donor. 
because then they come to the plan giving office and say, you know, that name on my building with a such a size size, I want a larger size, you know, that the donor can hold the check and wave it and negotiate it. So uh, there's no legal difference. The only legal requirement is that the check is issued from the IRA in the name of the charity. And most IRA administrators mail it directly to the charity. The problem the charity has is when the Bank of America or, you know, Merrill Lynch or whoever has, says to the university, here's a check from the IRA of Stephen Smith. And they go, oh, we got a lot of Stephen Smiths. And so sometimes the donor says, you never acknowledge me for my gift. Oh, thank you. You're the Stephen Smith. So that's one of the issues that can be a problem when the IRA mails the check straight to the charity. Right. That makes sense. Um, next question is from Michael. Michael is asking, in the foreseeable future, do you see an IRA becoming available to fund a CGA? And do you have any thoughts on that? I, I do not see a lifetime gift to a CGA. But when I talked about that IRA being liquidated in five years, my gosh, because a chair of trust, you really kind of need like a half million dollars to go to a bank, and I know some universities will still do it for $100,000, but there are administrative costs, and of course, people love the charitable gift annuity. So um, th there are some legal issues of having an IRA payable to a charitable gift annuity, and, and I don't really address that in this program here. Um, I, I'm a little near, leery of it. I have private letter rulings that say that a bequest of an IRA to a charitable manor trust is perfectly legal. There's no tax problems. There's one private letter ruling of an IRA at death going for a charitable gift annuity, but it doesn't address all the legal issues. It's like the first one that came out, and Frank Minton got it with, with David Wheeler. Uh, but it's just the IRS bureaucracy has got people who deal with charitable deduction, deal with income tax, and they didn't get everybody in on board. So if the IRAs have to be liquidated in five years, we definitely need some legal guidance. And at death, it's going to be very attractive. Lifetime, there's just no way that you have a good tax outcome to do lifetime to charitable gift annuity, just like lifetime to charitable major trust. Lifetime gifts from IRAs have to be 100% charitable and there can't be any uh, personal tax benefit. Um, now, whether the IRA could actually buy the charitable gift annuity inside the IRA is an issue because an IRA can be annuitized with a commercial annuity like you know Northwestern Mutual or MetLife, you can buy an annuity there inside the IRA. Could the IRA buy a charitable gift annuity inside the IRA? That's an interesting issue. No legal guidance yet, but that's all I know. Great. Uh, Kate is asking if grandchildren have generation skipping tax on an IRA? That's correct. If you're wealthy enough to pay the federal estate tax, in my example, grandma leaves it to granddaughter, you have the generation skipping tax. Do You do have to worry about that for taxable estates. Uh, in my example, I'm dealing with the 99% of people who do not have a taxable estate, and it is perfectly legal with no tax problem to name the grandchild if you have an estate under five and a half million dollars. But you're right, um, and I, I didn't mention that. I'm so glad the question came in. If you're rich enough to pay the estate tax, yeah, it's a problem naming the granddaughter, anyone more than 38 years younger. Okay. Uh, Robin is has a question about income-based charitable bequest. She's asking what happens if taxable income is less than the amount of the charitable bequest? Can we say first pay out the IRD and the CGA, but to the extent not sufficient, pay out of corpus? Yeah, and I've done this in a slide at the Chicago Institute, and uh, I didn't put it in writing here because it's so dangerous, uh, but here's my suggestion. So let's take your example. Let's say there's going to be a $100,000 charitable bequest. And let's say we think that there's only going to be $30,000 worth of income in administering the state. 30, 31, 32, who knows? And so you say, I leave all the income of my estate to charity. But if there's less than $100,000, pay the dif difference out of corpus. That, that clause is kind of common. You know, if I pay the charity out of my IRA. If the IRA is less than $100,000, pay the rest out of my estate. So that's the clause. Uh, pay all the income to charity. If it's less than 100, pay the rest from corpus. And let's say there's only 30,000 worth of income. How confident am I that if we simply write a check to the charity for $100,000, by having that clause in the will, I'm guaranteed a $30,000 charitable income tax deduction? 
And again, we're, we're, this is cutting edge law. To the best of my knowledge, I just thought of this idea in April and I just wrote it up in October. My suggestion is this. Don't cut a check to the charity for $100,000. My suggestion is cut two checks to the charity. Cut one check for $30,000 from one account that only has deposits of income. And cut the other check for $70,000 from the checking account that the decedent had at the time of death. Because then I think you have a really good chance of getting the deduction. Because then you have, the, the law says, and this is in the article, that the charitable income tax deduction must be traced to income. And number one, I have instructions in the governing instrument that says give income to charity. And number two, with a paper trail, I can show the income indeed went to charity, and therefore I get the deduction. And just the last thought, if you remember anything a year from now about this program, is the IRS can always argue substance over form. They say, you look at the paperwork, it just said give income, but they didn't do anything, and we win. But IRS can argue substance over form, but the taxpayer is always stuck with form. Your documents have, your contemporaneous written acknowledgements have to be received before filed. Appraisals have to be good. We are stuck with form. And if we take these instructions and have the form follow the instructions, I think you got a really good shot that you would have a charitable income tax deduction of all 30. Hope that answers the question. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from Matthew. He's saying, do you have any comments or thoughts on getting an IRA administrator to accept instructions that don't fit within their cookie cutter designation form? Uh, this happens all the time. For example, mutual funds have a one-inch space for naming a beneficiary, and you want to say, uh, follow the instructions of my trust instrument. Um, the, the short answer is uh, when they just say we cannot accept that, you just move the IRA someplace else to an administrator who's friendly. It's not an easy solution, but it, it, that's how you get your outcome the way you want it when they just uh, refuse to accept your instructions. One instruction nobody accepts, I'll just warn you, is you want to say the first $100,000 on my IRA goes to charity, the rest goes to my daughter. Nobody does that. We, we had a meeting at the ABA, and somebody stood up and said, I've had, tried with all these banks, not a single one will accept that. You can run that through your trust instrument that way, but to have it on the IRA beneficiary form, no IRA administrator will do that. And just heads up for that. Uh, Jeff is asking, can you assign a life insurance at death to a CRT or CGA? Can you assign a life insurance at death? I, I, I'm not sure if they mean transfer the policy versus name them as a beneficiary. Um, I'd have to think about that. Okay. Jeff, if you're still listening, which it looks like you are, um, if you want to explain your question. Oh, he just wrote in. He's saying name name as a beneficiary. So yeah. Can you assign? Yeah. So you can say the CRT name to my trust. That, that, that'll work. Same thing for this IRA to CRT at death. You don't have to establish the IRA, CRT in a lifetime. You can have the IRA be payable to the chair of trust named in my last will and testament. And then the CRT can be inside the will, and you create it after death. Uh, get a tax ID number, send it to the IRA. The IRA then writes the check to CRT, done deal. You don't have to create a CRT in your lifetime. And you can do the same thing with, with the life insurance policy payable with the CRT named in my last will and testament. Okay, and I just uh, looked up and we're at one o'clock straight up. So we do have a handful of other questions um, that came in that we didn't get to. So Christopher has offered his email address, which you see on the screen right now. Um, if you have questions that you really wanted answered or if you think of something else about the presentation uh, in the future that you have questions on, feel free to reach out to Christopher, his email. You can also email Nathan or myself. If you have questions on Stelter's products or services, you can email Stella at Stelter and be sure to visit us at Stelter.com. And I just wanted to thank Christopher so much for taking the time with us today, the last hour, and sharing your expertise with our audience. We had close to 400 people logged in today spending their lunch hour with us. So I hope that you all um, felt it was time well spent. And thank you so much, Christopher. Um, and the final note is one of the uh, 
questions that we get a lot is, can I get the slides and can I view the recording? And the answer is yes. I did send out the slides to those who are registered this morning, but we, we will also make those available on our website at filter.com backslash webinars along with the recording. Um, those will be ready by Monday and you will receive an email from myself letting you know when, when they're available. So. Thanks again. Thanks everyone for joining us this afternoon. Be sure to check out our next webinar, which is November 8th, and that's going to be on Matures to Boomers, what plan giving professionals need to know, um, with our own Cheryl Sturm, Director of Marketing Research, and Nathan Stelter. So you can register for that today by going to stelter.com backslash webinars. Thanks so much everyone for being here, and I hope you have a great afternoon. Bye-bye.